<laughs> municipal governments are local elected authorities. They include cities, towns, and villages, and rural, county, or metropolitan municipalities. In the political trenches, local government at work, we dive into the top issues facing local government across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, and I am joined by my co host, Ian McCormick, president of Strategic Steps Incorporated. Today, we will be discussing big changes at local levels across Canada, how municipalities are dealing with the climate crisis and strong mayor powers. We will also be joined by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, President Tanin Rudick. Ian, how are you? It's good to be back again, Chris. It's nice. It doesn't seem like it's been two weeks since we did our first episode. I'm kind of looking forward to this one too, B being for big changes. Of course, it is certainly something that uh, we're seeing on the horizon for sure. Big changes, big changes. That is exactly right. Um, Vancouver, Victoria, Winnipeg, and Ottawa, only to name a few, saw the elections of new mayors in the last few weeks. Some new mayors include Mayor-elect Mark Sutcliffe of Ottawa and Vancouver Mayor Ken Sims from, well, Vancouver, have no prior municipal experience that they are going into this role. While cities like Victoria, Mayor-elect Maureen Alto, and Winnipeg, Mayor-elect Scott Gillingham, have prior municipal experience. And with a new crop of mayors being elected across Canada, should we expect, expect some big changes locally? I think so, Chris. It, it's pretty obvious. If you change one or two people on a council, you change the dynamic of that group, you change the culture of that group anyway. If you change them out of the big chair, particularly if they're new in the big chair without having any experience in the past, that changes things even more. I mean, most people have dealt with those uh, the idea of group uh, group dynamics about the forming, storming, norming, performing thing. And I suspect that that's going to happen as well. And in some of the mayors you referenced uh, were elected on significant issues. We saw the same thing happen in Surrey, for example, where the, the incumbent mayor uh, was ousted. And one of the reasons was because of the transition from the RCMP to a municipal police force. And uh, the voters seemingly spoke to say that that wasn't uh, something they were they were interested in. And when we see turnover in the range of almost 50%, say, on councils in BC, it's not only the people in the big cities that are seeing their representation change, it's the people in the small towns and the villages, uh, some of the and the rural areas as well that are seeing. So the short answer to your question is, yeah, we're seeing a lot of change coming to local government, and it's not unique. This, we're talking about BC. You've made some reference to Manitoba. Sorry, yeah, Manitoba and Ontario and elsewhere, too. So we're, we're seeing this more and more. What I do see, however, though, with this high turnover is a lot of inexperience coming onto councils, which is not a bad thing, unless it's maybe more than half of council who doesn't have a lot of experience. And then there's a lot of training to be done. There's onboarding and there's orientation understand the ropes and as soon as councils get elected they I mean they, they're thrust into budget right away too. juxtapose that I think with the uh, voter turnout and when voter turnout has been at historically low levels I think I saw a large city in Ontario running at about 18 percent which I mean that might be kind of good for a by-election but for a general election is really really low. What that tells me is a couple of things it's uh, voter dissatisfaction what's in it for me why would I bother getting out of bed and going to vote the other is the disproportionate amount of power that those people who do vote has. So if you can get together a voting block, particularly in a smaller community, you stand a really good chance of getting your person elected with only a few hundred votes in some of those cases. So with the changes in, in uh, people who are being elected and when they get to understand their jobs, there will certainly, I think, be some significant changes right across Canada in local government representation. How much of a responsibility is it for mayors, particularly new incoming mayors, to foster that relationship of, I don't want to say kumbaya, but a kumbaya attitude when dealing with new, newly elected and re-elected councillors? It, it is learning to go. There are very few, we've talked about this before, there are very few qualifications to actually put your name on a ballot in a municipality in Canada. The There is, you are building... I mean, what I call the first team for the municipality. It's not a team that chose its teammates. It's a team that was brought together by people in the community. And sometimes it, in a ward or a division-based um, based municipality, larger municipalities by and large, or rural municipalities, you it's not even a ranked ballot. So it's people in geographical area B and A and geographical area B send two people who are 
potentially completely different, which I mean, inherently is a good thing if they manage to get along and have a set of shared values, because that I think enriches the conversation, enriches the debate, makes for better decisions. The mayor or Reeve or warden uh, does uh, symbolically at least have a bit of a role to start to bring that team together right at the very beginning. And a big, a big hurdle can be some of the acrimony that came out during the election campaign, uh, if it's fiercely contested. If it's something that is uh, not, if it's an acclamation say, then that certainly doesn't happen. But a forming of the team, that initial forming and storming piece uh, is really quite important. And some of that is like formal team building maybe, it's getting off with my, um, council colleagues and figuring out what our priorities are for the coming time and how each other ticks, what we do for work, about our families, those kind of things. So those can be important as well. So that's formal, the informal, just interacting with one another. We always think about local governments being the politicians, but local government is not just the politicians. It's also the CAOs, it's the directors, it's the staff, it's the uh, public work officers who go out and fix the roads. While there's been big changes at the elected positions, changes don't often happen as big at the administration level. When you're coming in as a new administration with a new mayor or a new council, how much does that dictate how the administration has to deal with a potential massive change of direction or uh, policies around what the new mayor or new council is looking for? Well, first of all, because they're the only employee of council, the CAO, uh, city manager, county manager, does stand a reasonable chance of changing voluntarily or not uh, <laughs> within six months, say, of an election. Although some of the elect some of councils will flex that muscle prior to an election as well. So when we see change, we often see change fairly soon after an election and at that senior level. So there can certainly be some change. Below that, I think the best administrations see see what's coming, see the writing on the wall, recognize what people, individual candidates might be, might have on their platforms and are kind of prepared to do that because there's no real transition period after an election either. You just kind of get down to work, whether you're administrative or whether you're political. So the best awareness you have of that, so much the better. I've heard it's not uncommon for administrators to gather up election brochures and look through websites and try and figure out what each candidate and then each councillor has said are their priorities too, and then try and align them to their own priorities. There's a chapter in my first book that says, when push comes to shove, it's the CAO who gets shoved. And because council is there fundamentally representing the people, whether you like council or don't like council, like the mayor, don't like mayor. Um, earlier this month, the cost of the Hay River flood recovery came in at over $174 million dollars. With the cost still unknown from the cleanup of Hurricane Fiona in Atlantic Canada, it makes me wonder, Ian, while provincial governments and the federal government have taken a lead on the climate file, should municipalities begin looking at the impact of climate change and budgeting for potential disasters? And I hate saying potential disasters because we see fires in Alberta, we see fires in uh, BC. I never wish them upon anyone, but they are a reality that we live in now. So should municipalities start budgeting for potential natural disasters? I think of course. And if, if they're not, their insurance companies are talking about it. And uh, so because a lot of the cost, I suspect you meant you made reference to Hay River at 174 million. There's no way that a community the size of Hay River in the Northwest Territories could cover that cost by itself. Even using asking the territory to contribute or the federal government to contribute, it's still money that could have been spent on other things that is now being used to spend on disaster recovery. It doesn't even talk about getting ahead of the ahead of the curve. I think we saw many years ago when Winnipeg built its uh, spillway around the city as a way to prevent the uh, the Red River from flooding over its banks within the city. And that still happens a little bit, I guess. So some of that uh, anticipatory piece, asset management, infrastructure replacement. I, I'm not a climatologist, but people keep saying, hey, we're getting the once in hundred year flood every two or three years or hail storm or uh, wind event, you, you made reference to the hurricane on the on the East Coast. So municipalities, whether they like to or not, do have to start anticipating these things as well. And working with 
insurance companies working with uh, the other orders of government to make a rec create a recognition that science doesn't really care what your political opinion is. It's going to rain a lot or it's going to be heavy, a lot of heavy wind in places that you don't want it. So some of it then becomes, if we can get ahead of it, infrastructure is a good, a good example of that. It starts to fall into things like asset management too. So the federal government can download to provinces, provinces can download to local governments, and the local governments really have no one else to download to. They just would choose to ignore something. But as you have made reference, the people who live in the communities aren't going to tolerate that. So with the downloading of responsibility, however, whether it's done consciously or not, doesn't usually come with downloading of um, commensurate resources or authority either. So it really squeezes municipalities. They have demand for programs, services, infrastructure that's growing faster than the rate of their population growth and faster than their ability to pay, pay for it. So they have to make more and more strategic choices, which means they likely have to be evaluating some of the programs that they currently have and then making some tough decisions about what we need to do and what we ought not to do which is where topics such as priority-based budgeting may come in, where, where really good asset management plans come in, and even looking outwards where things like working with provincial or territorial associations or the federal, uh, federal associations as well to lobby for some of these changes over the long term can also have an impact, I think. In Ontario, Premier Doug Ford has announced prior to the municipal elections that the mayors of Ottawa, in Toronto would get so-called strong mayor powers because he, and I'm paraphrasing here, said, well, what's the point of being mayor without a little bit more power? So Ontario, Ottawa and Toronto are heading into a strong mayor power, which gives them the ability to veto and speed up uh, permits that they believe are in the best interest of the province, but also their city. This is a new phenomenon of uh, Ontario or municipal politics and municipal governments. We do not have strong mayors in Canada. They are, we have a weak mayor system. And I think we have said that term over and over again, where they are one vote on council, but they do get to, uh, direct the agenda of what is going to be at council. What is your thoughts on this proposal? Well, I guess it's not really a proposal anymore because it's coming like a train out of Toronto Union Station. Okay, so this is kind of, I see it as dipping our toe, if you like, in the in the pool of, uh, of strong mayor-ism. And it could be deep, it could be shallow, we don't really know because this is something that we haven't seen before. I wouldn't be surprised, however, if, the, if the majority or a lot of people who are observers rather than looking at this in detail, I think we already have some, uh, strong mayors because a lot of our media, for example, comes to the US where the mayor's veto powers as you've made reference to and a lot of things, a lot of times happen or the mayor has an executive, mayor does a lot of the hiring, evaluation, replacing of people like the city manager. So it may already be a fait accompli for a lot of people thinking it is that way. But in, in Ontario, with the application of a, you made a reference to the, to the couple of places where we start to see the strong mayor powers take over. My suspicion is that that only will last in as much as there is uh, the will or the alignment between those municipalities and the provincial government. Because as the province giveth, the province could take it away with an amendment to their acts as well. So if the province finds that some of the things that they have asked mayors to do aren't being done because it, under the strong mayor provisions they could conceivably remove them as well however they could also they could expand them and other provinces may be looking at this as a bit of a litmus test to see what works and whether it ought to be applied elsewhere too well, what do you think for those who are listening right now for those who are watching right now do you think alberta should bring in strong mayor powers do you think other provincial jurisdictions should bring in strong mayor powers this is a unique time in our system because we are seeing premiers from across this country talking about more changes to municipalities whether it be political parties whether it be strong mayor powers which they've already passed in ontario do you think it's needed do you think the mayor of your council should have more powers and responsibilities than just the similar responsibilities of a councillor. So let us know, send us an email, tag us on social media, the political trenches pod at 
sorry, the political trenches pod at gmail.com. Send us an email. Greatly appreciate it. If you do, we've heard some great feedback already. Send it in. We want to hear from you because we want to keep this dialogue going and we want you guys to be part of it. So send us a message and let us know, do you believe in strong mayor powers? And we will be right back with our guest of today's show, Federation of Canadian Municipalities Presidents, Tanin Rudick. Our guest today is the president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, President Tanine Rudick. Tanine was first elected in 2010 as councillor in the town of Vegreville in Alberta. She was then elected to the FCM Board of Directors in 2017. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities has been the national voice of municipal government since 1901. Their members include more than 2,000 municipalities of all sizes from Canada cities and rural communities to northern communities and 20 provincial and territorial municipal association. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities represents more than 90% of all Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Welcome to the Political Trenches, Tanine. I'm so happy to be speaking with you and Ian about FCM. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here with both of you today. So I, I'm going to get the line of questions off the bat here, uh, Tanine, and I want to start with this. In your opinion, and that as president of the FCM, what are the biggest issues facing municipalities today? Well, I guess... That, that's a multifaceted question with a lot of different ways to answer it. I think everything happens in community. So really the pressures that Canadians are feeling in communities of all sizes reflects in the issues um, that municipalities are facing. So whether it's housing, it's affordability uh, in terms of rising inflation, we're talking about infrastructure pressures, we're talking about climate impacts, whether it's a fire, a flood, a drought, a hurricane, and public safety. And so those are some of the top issues that we're advocating on. And the, the core basis point for all of this is sustainability, the ability to continue doing the good work that we do every day for Canadians in every corner of the country. Can I pick up on that just a little bit? And recognizing the country is quite broad, as Chris said in the introduction, of course, three different coasts. I expect you see some different issues popping up in Maritime Canada versus the Pacific and, and the prairies in the north as well, do you see much in the way of regional differences? And does FCM then therefore have to take slightly different focus uh, throughout the country too? We certainly do. I mean, trying to represent uh, one vision for Canadian municipalities would be a, a bit difficult, but a lot of the things that municipalities are facing, and I've seen it firsthand, whether it is uh, a city like Waterloo or Yellowknife facing the issue of homelessness, for example, it presents itself differently, but it still needs to be um, resolved and supported by municipal and local solutions. And Honestly, we're the best order of government suited to answer some of those difficult questions. And for that reason, too, what you're asking is, is that we can't use a homogenous answer, uh, but the issues that we face across the country require a little bit of nuance. And for that reason, too, municipalities are best suited to do that. We understand that local is the, be the best way to be able to answer some of these questions. I've also noticed you've been abroad as well, representing FCM and Canada internationally. What do you see going on elsewhere as well? Are there things that we can learn from other parts of the world? Are there significantly different issues in different parts of the world? How are we helping out as Canadians? Well, I think that's actually uh, a, an aspect of my FCM role as president that I wasn't fully apprised of um, how important <laughs> our our role is. I, I know that FCM is very active in supporting local governments around the world, but I wasn't aware of the actual role that we play uh, in the United Cities for local government. And as the, the chair of the North American Assembly, um, I have the ability to be able to, to talk to some of our counterparts across the globe and see that they too, again, whether it's Africa or 
um, talking to a mayor from a port city in Malaysia about climate impact on her port city is very similar to having those conversations with some of my friends um, in eastern Canada experiencing the hurricane that they just underwent and being able to understand how do we build better resilience in our communities, how do we plan better for the future, those are all really important lessons and there are other things that we can share as well. Canada doesn't have it right yet, um, but we work really hard on increasing the number of women that are involved in local government. And so some of our most successful projects are working with local leaders in Sri Lanka or Jordan, uh, most recently, uh, as well as other places across the globe to be able to share those learnings and, and learn from one another. You talked about infrastructure, and I want to jump on that for a second here, because during our month-long series on the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, we, we talked with municipal leaders from across this great country, from coast to coast to coast, and one of the reoccurring themes that came up was infrastructure, aging infrastructure to be exact. And now, uh, as FCM, you have to sort of uh, approach and lobby the government to sort of help these municipalities, but also the provincial organizations that make up their uh, that make up the organizations like Alberta municipalities or Newfoundland and Labrador municipalities. How does FCM work with the provincial but also local governments to lobby the provincial and well the federal government? Sorry on important issues like infrastructure, because like Ian said, you have a diverse group of organizations, diverse group of communities that are all facing different infrastructure needs. How do you sort of have to sort through them and try to figure out how do you approach the government in a way that everyone gets their fair shot at funding dollars? So infrastructure is some of the most important um, pieces of pipe and um, the roadways and the construction across the country that literally built this country. And for that reason, too, it's incredibly important that we get that conversation correct with the federal government, allowing for that space with our uh, members to be able to have those conversations with our provincial and territorial associations and respecting their autonomy, too. But all that said, local governments own over 60% of the infrastructure that um, supports the economy and the quality of life of Canadians in every community across the country. And it's really important that we do that intentional, forward-looking, resilient uh, construction of the roadways, the water, the wastewater, the ports, the airplane, airports. We've got a wide range of types of infrastructure that municipalities are responsible for. And we're at the precipice while the federal government is renegotiating some of those infrastructure um, funding dollars. So for that reason, we're able to advocate with some facts and some data demonstrating the importance of investing in community by investing in infrastructure. And that is something that we can definitely do across the country. All politics are local, of course. You live, Absolutely. Everybody lives in community. They've chosen, they've moved to a place. They've chosen to remain there. Their families are there. A lot of times their careers are there as well. You have moved, not literally, but figuratively moved from uh, the, the municipal stage to the provincial stage to the national stage, but you're still a member of town council in Vagreville. And just kind of wondering how uh, your colleagues in Vagreville have been able to help you as you have moved through these stages um, over the last few years? I think one of the things I, I'm always appreciative of is that if I'm not here, quite literally, or if I'm distracted um, or consumed by other issues, then my other members of council need to be able to pick up some of the weight um, on my committees, which they are more than capable and willing to do. And I appreciate that so very much. The other part is um, their experience and their knowledge really informs some of the advocacy that I do when I go to other places. It's uh, a little overwhelming to be in Korea, for example, last week and try to imagine examples and reflecting on um, how public service provision is actually an element of local economic development. Um, and then reflected back on our own community and being able to see how well we do things in our small community here in Vegreville, um, but also bring that perspective to the national level as well, that those experiences are anecdotal, but they are also a real capture of what's happening in communities. That's really interesting too, because to me anyway, because it, as much as we are we, you are um, taking Canada to the rest of the world. Some, you are bringing back the rest of the world to Canada, to Alberta, to Vegreville as well. And probably there are some principles and some ideas there that are going to end up benefiting your community in the long run. 
I, I hope that's the case. I, I do try to be very cautious about um, talking too much because it is very exciting to be able to sit on a panel with the vice mayor of Rome and a councillor from Beggarville right beside each other and just sort of put that into perspective. At the end of the day, what we're talking about is making the quality of life better for the people that we serve. Right. And that is universal. And being able to find those commonalities between people is what we do on a local level too. We talk to people to our neighbors and find out what we have in common, find out what their concerns are and try to reach them at a, a human level. And that's no different uh, in this forum as well. I, I want to still stick on this democracy point because in the last few weeks we have seen BC go to the polls, Ontario just go to the polls, Manitoba just recently as of recording this this week, and then PEI is going to the polls municipally later on in November. Um, we are seeing some big changes, and that's the theme of today's episode, big changes. Um, from your standpoint, how does the FCM adapt to the changes that they're seeing municipally with new mayors coming in, with the new councillors being elected? How does the FCM play a role in fostering uh, relationships with new mayors, but also new councillors and making sure that the transition that from old mayor to new mayor is there, that when you're approaching council or the Canadian government, you're not asking for something that the old mayor asked for. And now the new mayor says, that's not a priority for me. Well, I, I would actually liken it to the changing of the guard in council. So it's really important that there's some uh, consistency and some con continuity in the structure. So FCM has some good governance processes in place because, of course, our staff that helps us with our government relations and our public policy work um, remain a constant element. So even while we've had a lot of flux and we've lost some fantastic board members, I mean, we had an executive committee meeting this week where we had some tears, quite literally, about losing some really strong key members, um, both to election loss and, and also a loss of life. Um, you know, we're all leaders in our communities. We're all passionate about what we do. And it's important to have that um, voice carried across the country and, and be able to have that local perspective um, from, from the very smallest to the very largest. So some of what we do is rely on good governance and that structure of FCM. The other part is advocacy again, too, is we want to make sure there's a lot to learn when you're first elected. But it's very important that people understand that uh, FCM has an important role to play. So even if you, for example, aren't a member, the 10% of municipalities that don't belong yet <laughs> are going to be uh, benefic beneficiaries of our advocacy work because the grants that we receive from the federal government are significant and they are a key part of their, um, their budget they're, that they're going to be delivering um, to their communities. So there's two parts to that, I think. I'd like to pick up a little bit too on something that uh, the election piece, having more than more than half of Canadians going through municipal elections this fall, from literally from coast to coast to coast. We are seeing voter turnout really low, and, and it seems to be some historic lows in some of the places in Ontario. At the same time, we're seeing immense turnover in councils. BC was running up to 50%, and, and uh I wonder if you see those two things as related and whether you see a role for FCM or whether you think it's perhaps got something external to the individual, the municipality, culture, social media, any of those sorts of things that's causing both low turnout and high turnover. So I actually think that even speaking with some of our colleagues at the United Cities for Local Government, this seems to be a global issue that while people are really under pressure and feeling angst, um, Voter turnout is very low uh, for a number of different reasons. I, I wouldn't be able to comment on that specifically with some authority, but I do know that just on first reflection, speaking to some of my colleagues and reflecting back a year ago when we had our elections here in Alberta, I think people are angry after COVID. They've experienced a lot of unrest. Um, they're feeling a lot of mistrust for the political process. They feel disengaged um, at a time when it's most important important to ensure that the answers that are happening locally support the, the lives that they are seeking as Canadians. The challenge that I'm seeing, though, is that the people that are motivated to vote sometimes are the ones that are really angry. Yeah. And so that's meant that sometimes um, people are maybe disconnected from what's actually happening in their community. So the ones that are angry are getting out and voting. 
And the ones that are actually happy and satisfied with what's happening locally actually aren't voting. So I'm not sure how we answer that in the right way, particularly when there have been some recent work that, uh, fairly recent work that FCM did about the, the trust that Canadians have in local government of all orders of government. They feel that municipal politicians are trustworthy and they believe what they say. At the same time, we're seeing some really abysmal voter turnout, particularly in Ontario. I want to wrap up with this last question because I know you are a busy woman and I want to make sure that you get to your next meeting or your next uh, email that you have to get to as quickly as possible. And I want to know what's next for the FCM. We're heading into 2023 here. Um, Municipalities are facing a lot of unique issues as we've talked about in the last 20 minutes. But what is on the agenda for FCM in particular? Is there anything that you want to accomplish in the next year before your the, your term's up? Or is there anything that the FCM is working on behind the scenes that they're excited to get involved in in, in 2023? So I, I don't want to just rattle through a list because these are all really important pieces, but I, I appreciate you asking. We're really at an important um inflection point right now where the federal government uh, in its current iteration is looking for solutions to some really complicated problems and we believe as local leaders we can provide some of the support we don't have all the answers but having those conversations uh, will lead to some better outcomes for all of us we know that there is a real challenge in the type of money that's available so it's really important that we invest in important um, funding in the right way So I mentioned housing before, that's a critical piece of our advocacy, talking about the affordability across the the range of options from homelessness right up to first time home buyers to those that are retiring and, and being able to meet those tools across the spectrum and making sure that Canadians have a decent place to call home seems like the most basic need, but it's becoming ever more difficult. Uh, infrastructure investment, like I referenced, if we don't get this right, it's going to cost us a heck of a lot money, a lot more money later on, and we need to do that investment in a way that's resilient and sustainable. And the only way that we can do that is by having some really intentional conversations about um, including other considerations, which leads us to the next really big piece of advocacy around climate. And we need to to better protect communities from the new and the increasingly frequent weather extremes, whether it is um, a big investment into the national adaptation strategy. We made a number of recommendations to the federal government last month with some specific uh, requests in terms of information and additional funding to be able to meet that need. And we also are talking about public safety. We have an RCMP uh, bargaining agreement that was signed on behalf of municipalities without our knowledge or participation. And it's been delivered de facto to us. So that continues to be an ask. We're asking the federal government to cover all of those retroactive costs, as well as uh, moving into the future. We want to talk about the safety, inclusiveness, and resilience of communities. And that means talking about who's living in our communities and how we're going to best support them. And that is being applied in every way with um, an anti-racism and equity lens across the board, ensuring that Canadians of all sorts have access to the levers of power. I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure to sit down with you and discuss some of the issues with Ian and myself that are going on with FCM and try to pick your brain for a little bit about what's actually going on at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So I want to thank you so much, President Rudick. Thank you so much. I am just so thrilled to be able to speak on behalf of such a dynamic and diverse um, set of thought leaders and um, It is an incredibly rewarding experience being able to represent municipal leaders across the country because they are truly making a difference right where their people live. Uh, And I'm so honored to be able to speak to you today about the FCM. Thank you. We will be right back after a quick uh, break. We've talked big changes, we've talked climate change, we've talked strong mayor powers, we've had a fascinating conversation with Tanine Rudick, President of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. How'd you feel today's episode went? You know, I thought it was a really interesting sense of alignment. The the news items that we had kind of picked up were resonant with what uh, 
Councillor Rudick had said too. So to me, it kind of shows that what's happening locally is happening na happening nationally. And she has also said that, of course, a lot of the things that were happening nationally are also happening internationally. So while all politics is local, uh, we're finding a lot of similarity across the country and beyond. So I think that was a really interesting insight. So I want to thank everyone for sending in their feedback from episode one. We heard you. As you've noticed, we've put the news up front. That's the, the format of the show going forward. News will be first, and then we'll be bringing on our guests later on. So we want to thank everyone for reaching out to the political trenches pod at gmail.com. Send in your feedback, following us on Twitter, following us on Facebook. We have some updates. We're going to be doing some polls. We talked about the strong mayor powers. Leave us your feedback because we want to hear from you because this is going to be an interactive show where we're going to be getting some feedback from you and talking about it in future episodes. And the next episode, I want Ian to sort of announce this because as we talked about A for L, uh, amalgamation, B for big, uh, um, that, uh, big changes. What's C going to be about, Ian? Well, I'm glad we're doing this in alphabetical order because that makes it so much easier for me. C is for CAO or Chief Administrative Officer. So we're going to invite a few uh, CAOs, one or two CAOs onto the show, and uh, we're going to talk to them about the state of local government from their side of the uh, council bench. And I think that'll be really interesting, Chris. That's right, Ian. Uh, we will be back on November 16th for another episode of The Political Trenches. If you can, like us, share us on Facebook, share us on Twitter, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, but also give us a review. Uh, leave us a feedback and send us a message if you want. So with that, this has been The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. I've been Chris Brown, my co-host Ian McCormack. We will be back next time.